Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the AI 2030 show. My name is Xiao Chenjiang, the CEO of Fintech for Good. And uh, today on the show, I have an uh, uh, old friend, Dan. And uh, I have known Dan for many years and uh, always follow uh, his exciting work. And uh, welcome back, Dan. Great to be here, Xiao Chen. Yeah, so just a yeah, before we start, and can you introduce yourself and provide a brief overview of your background and expertise in the field of uh, spatial, spatial web and AI? Uh, happily, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I'm the uh, founder and president of a company called uh, Versus AI. That's Versus with an E, V E R S E S AI. Uh, and the website's versus.ai. Uh, and I'm also a uh, founder and director of uh, the Spatial Web Foundation. Uh, these two uh, organizations work together. Uh, the, uh, the Spatial Web Foundation has created a new protocol uh, to um, uh, link together uh, all the IoT devices and drones and other kinds of things that the World Wide Web doesn't yet uh, link. And uh, then also it enables uh, AI then to be uh, uh, used uh, everywhere uh, on the planet in a uh, globally networked environment. Uh, so. Um, so there we finally now, instead of having an internet of just computers, which was the internet, the original internet, then we have an internet of documents, which is the World Wide Web. Now we're going to have a network of artificially intelligent uh, uh, applications running uh, our cities, our airports, our hospitals, uh, all kinds of things. And uh, the spatial web enables that. Awesome. And uh, so... Yeah, for our audience, uh, you know, could you share some of the most exciting projects or initiative you are currently involved within the realm of spatial web and AI? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, the the as we all know, uh, uh, AI. This is the age of AI. Uh, things are just blowing up really big. Uh, companies like OpenAI uh, are are huge. Uh, they build uh, uh, GPT two. Then they take a couple of years to build GPT-3 and hundreds of millions of dollars. Then they take a couple of years and build GPT-4, hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, so it's kind of not a very sustainable business. You have to build these huge uh, machines. And then uh, when they're done, we get to kind of engage with the machine and ask it questions. And, and uh, it gives us responses. And it's kind of magical and, and it's pretty cool. Uh, but um, it has a number of problems. Uh, uh, they're very expensive to build and very expensive to run. Uh, they use massive amounts of water and electricity, and uh, they're really unsustainable. Um, and so um, the other problem is they're kind of a big black box. Um, uh, if you're a doctor and you're doing a, you know, you're, you're doing an analysis of a patient, uh, the, the, the black box might say, well, uh, given all the uh, symptoms, I think you should... Uh, uh, amputate the leg. Uh, and you know, well, how did you arrive at that? Well, we don't really know. It's a big black box of neurons and it just kind of spits out an answer. And it's wrong about, you know, anywhere from five to 25% of the time. So it's kind of not very useful for uh, mission critical applications or uh, uh, things that uh, where you really need to audit how it arrived at the thing. The other problem is uh, that it, um, it's giving you answers on data that it has inside the box, but it's not looking at the world in real time. So what we've done is we've created an entirely new type of AI. So this is an AI uh, that's fully auditable and um, we don't build it. <laughs> uh, so we do it very much like the World Wide Web. Tim Berners-Lee did not build the World Wide Web. What Tim Berners-Lee did in the early 1990s was create a, a couple of protocols that enabled everybody to build websites. So HTTP and HTML is all you need. And then you can build a website called Amazon, or you can build a website called eBay, or you can build a website called whatever it is, right? Uh, Etsy, uh, on and on and on. And I think we have now maybe uh, 20, 30 billion web pages in the world, done by millions of people all over the world. And then, but because they're all running on one protocol, they kind of function like a one single library. And then Google can index that entire library. Then you can quickly search it and find the exact page you're looking for. So 
that's a very exciting model. If one company tried to build the World Wide Web, it would be a horrible thing. It would take a couple of years and a couple hundred million. Oh, it was just like what OpenAI is doing now. And then, and then it wouldn't be that accurate because uh, who's building the websites in India and China and South Africa and all these things? And so we said, no, 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 uh, this, this, this model of these giant AI boxes is not the right model. What we'll do is we'll create uh, something more like the App Store uh, with a protocol. And so uh, anybody can build an app or a website. Um, you just learn how to do it. And really, almost in a weekend, you can build uh, an app for uh, the App Store or a web page or a website uh, for the World Wide Web. And so we create tools that enable anybody to build uh, their particular uh, AI that they're knowledgeable about. In your case, it might be a smart city in China. It might be a doctor. It might be a pediatric uh, uh, medicine that uh, for a nutritionist it might be the best nutrition for people to um, uh, maintain their health. Uh, and so then instead of one giant box of, made by a big company uh, that you don't, can't see inside of, <laughs> uh, we actually have the millions of small AIs that are all talking to each other every day and are all running on one protocol. So they kind of function like a big box but they're made up of little individual things that are all auditable. And then you can have a kind of like a Google AI or like an index that can go find you something. I, I need to know about nutrition, uh, you know, for myself, I'm, a, you know, I'm an adult male and blah, blah, blah. And I want to have an exercise routine and I want to lose 20 pounds because uh, you put together a diet for me. And now you're really talking to a real nutritionist. And, uh, that, and they're updating their app, uh, their AI app, uh, whenever they want, just like a website. So we don't have this problem of waiting for the next update, you know, in two years. Also, the AI is a new kind of AI that learns. And so uh, we partnered with the uh, number one neuroscientist in the world, Dr. Carl Friston uh, from University College London. And uh, you can look up our, Dr. Carl Friston's work. Uh, and he's developed an AI that learns. So OpenAI's AI doesn't actually learn. You have to build the box, then you can use it, but then they have to build the next box. So you're like waiting for a new laptop or a, a new iPhone or whatever. So they're machines. <clears throat> so what he, what he calculated was uh, what we really want is an AI that functions like a human. We learn a little bit every day. So I don't have to go in and get a new chip every uh, couple of years to update myself. I read or I go online and I talk to you or other people. <clears throat> and so uh, my, my world understanding is increasing every day. And so um, this is called active inference AI, as opposed to neural net type AIs, which is what LLMs are and large language models and other things that are out there. So this has never been in the world before, but we're the only company commercializing it. Uh, Dr. Friston joined us as chief scientist and uh, we have a wonderful PhD team. And so, um, so we're bringing this to the world next year for the first time. And the product will be called Genius. And uh, anybody will be able to use it to build their own AI and, uh, and publish it and monetize it just like they would an app in the App Store. And so that's a pretty exciting new model. And that'll unleash the uh, kind of collective wisdom of humanity and intelligence of humanity. But what's more important, it means that AIs will be built locally in Africa by Africans, in China by uh, Chinese people, in uh, India by Indians, and so on around the world. And so it's not us building it. It's we're building tools and, and letting anybody contribute to the library of intelligence. And then we've got AIs then that help you navigate through that to find what you're looking for. So I, we think it's a very, very exciting uh, new model and probably the correct model and more in line with... Uh, uh, the model that we're seeing uh, from the original internet. Um, before the internet in 1970, computers didn't talk to each other <clears throat> because uh, IBM had their own uh, way of, uh, of uh, talking to their machines and DEC had their own way and computers, they, companies were competitors. They didn't talk to each other. And what they realized is uh, if we created a protocol not owned by a company, then anybody could be on that network and you just give each machine an address and then they could send little text files to each other and they created email. Oh, wow. So then any computer in the world still today can talk to any other computer as long as it has an IP address. 
And so every phone now uh, comes with its own IP address in it. And your laptops come with IP addresses in them. So you can just plug them right into the internet and up you're up and running. And then the world with Tim Berners-Lee came along in the 90s and went, oh, well, let's do the same thing for documents. We'll give every document an address. We call it a URL. And then we'll... Uh, We'll just uh, let anybody uh, build their um, uh, build their uh, document as long as they uh, code it in HTML. One browser can read them all. Doesn't matter whether you build your document in India, whether you build it in South Africa, whether you build it in New York. They're all running on HTML. I mean, bitter enemies, uh, uh, websites in Russia and websites in Ukraine are both running on HTML and HTTP because if you're not running on the protocol, then you can't be you can't be found. And so, um, so we said, well, look, let's just don't, let's do exactly what's working. We'll build a protocol. And so we yeah. call it the hyperspace transaction protocol, HSTP, as opposed to HTTP, which we type in every day when we're doing our, our uh, web searches. And HTTP is a hypertext transfer protocol. So it's about transferring text across the network. But now we're going to be in spatial computing and, and information is going to be in the space around us and glasses are coming out and all kinds of amazing things. Apple launched their headsets. Uh, Facebook has Oculus. So we're going to have a lot more over this next five and 10 years. So um, let's create a protocol for spatial computing. And so that's called the hyperspace uh, transaction protocol. And then there's a hyperspace modeling language, which lets us build anything or model anything. So and then we can finally have um, entire cities uh, running in spatial environments with AI helping to manage the traffic and the electricity and other kinds of things. Same thing with hospitals, same things with airports, supply chains, all the things that really we're surrounded by in our daily life that are running very inefficiently. And now we'll be able to apply AI to them. And so we think this is going to create an AI revolution. So we'll still have large language models for doing content, uh, helping us write uh, our marketing programs, things like that. But they can't really do mission critical things or things that where you would really need to audit them. So this is really uh, what we're excited about. Uh, we've been building test uh, systems for the last three years in Europe and the U.S. with uh, various cities and with uh, companies. But now we're going to flip it over and give it to the world so they can start building apps. And look how many apps we have in the App Store. I mean, we have five million apps out there between Google and Apple. We've got, uh, 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 we've got uh, I think, 30, uh, 20, 30 billion web pages. So, yeah, exactly. So and then that, that's the mo mo move on to the next question. And sure. yeah, yeah, all what you said sounds ex extremely exciting. And, uh, you know, when I had a lot of conversation with uh, uh, scientists, experts around, uh, you know, the gen generative AI, and uh, many of them share the same concern as what you said, that, you know, AI need to be trained uh, with uh, much smaller data sets and then to just have large language model and then uh, have larger machine, it's just not sustainable. And of course that's, uh, you know, you, you mentioned several other concerns in terms of, uh, you know, the democratization of AI and, you know, those uh, have, don't have, and all that, uh, and which direction that AI should go. And I think uh, there to have alternatives uh, are extremely important. You know, when you just uh, compare uh, AI development with uh, with um, you know web or internet, I think that is a very interesting comparison. And when internet was uh, all the the the, the HTTP uh, protocol was created, and then the open source and also blockchain was a concept may not you know be be there at all. So now that when you create uh, this is a new type of AI. And, uh, you know, when you think about it, having everyone create their own AI and uh, um, in addition to the AI itself, uh, are you looking at also including the open source piece and also the blockchain and other emerging technology within AI? Yes, 100%. That's, it. that's not the AI part of it. That's the uh, spatial web part of it. So the spatial web... Uh, just like the World Wide Web connects every document, well, then the spatial web connects everything. Uh, those things could be buildings, they could be whatever. And so um, 
you could uh, you can uh, now with your smartphones uh, you have uh, uh, scanners built into them, and drones even have scanners, cameras, and things like that. There's a thing called photogrammetry. So we've got many ways of uh, uh, bringing the world around us, whether it's our stores, our restaurants, our cities, whatever, they're being scanned in with uh, laser scanners, with cameras, other kinds of things. So what's happening while we're sitting here, uh, cities all over the world are uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco, uh, Berlin, uh, London, they're making 3D copies of their entire city. And so those are there. Well, well then once you've got that, uh, what you need then is uh, the ability to incorporate AI, blockchains, cryptocurrencies, other kinds of things, so that you can do new things, new kinds of applications in those environments to be able to deliver better services to your citizens or to better track what's going on with your supply chain. So you could imagine uh, something being shipped from, uh, from uh, Shanghai to uh, Los Angeles uh, with the spatial web. Now you could watch it uh, moving across the entire world uh, through the container and when it arrives, uh, instead of all kinds of banking and, and letters of credit and other kinds of big uh, banking instruments, which take lots of time and cost lots of money, you can see it could be a simple blockchain transfer. Once the, uh, once the container arrives in uh, Los Angeles, the title transfers to the uh, local buyer and the payments are made automatically with a cryptocurrency uh, back to the, uh, back to the uh, uh, shipper in uh, China. And uh, AI is coordinating everything and keeping track of it all. And uh, you can see how it all works together. So it's, it's pretty exciting. So what we had to do with the spatial web was, uh, again, uh, follow, the, uh, follow the example of the Internet and the World Wide Web. Neither of those uh, protocols, uh, whether it's TCP IP for the original Internet or whether it's HTTP for the World Wide Web, neither of those are owned by a corporation. They're open source. Uh, they run. They run by a foundation. They're usually administered uh, by an independent uh, group, not a company. And so uh, we partnered with the IEEE, uh, which is the big standards body that does Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and all these other things. And so we've already transferred uh, the uh, the code uh, to ownership by the IEEE. And uh, so it's an open uh, open system available for anybody in the world. And uh, anybody can join the uh, committee, the Spatial Web Committee at the IEEE, that's P2874. And so really now it's in the public uh, domain. Uh, anybody can uh, uh, raise their hand and go, we think there's a better way of doing the addressing uh, or this or that, uh, other kinds of things. So, so we followed the uh, exact model of the World Wide Web now. And then, uh, then we just build tools uh, like uh, on the uh, kind of on the World Wide Web, you might use a tool like WordPress or Shopify or other things to actually more rapidly build your uh, your websites. You don't have to use that. You could use HTML, but most people use some kind of a programming tool. And so then we build the programming tools and that's Versus. And uh, so then we build AI uh, application tools so that anybody that wants to rapidly build an AI application can just use our tools and then they're already compatible with the spatial web protocols. But then since the protocols are in the public domain, anybody can compete with us. So you can just download the protocol, reverse engineer it and write your own tools, just like WordPress, then Shopify, then Wix, all these other tools came out. Uh, so the same thing with the spatial web. So we, we think it's the right model. And uh, uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's kind of the exciting approach. And then what we did on the, uh, on the corporate side is uh, most of the AI companies are privately held. If you look at all of them, whether it's Anthropic or OpenAI, they're not on the stock market. People can't own them. So large, uh, large venture capital funds uh, own all the stock. And, uh, and by the time they do go public at some point, then they're, they were, they're worth billions and billions of dollars. So all the real profits were made by all the investors in Silicon Valley. But we didn't do that. We took our company public immediately. And so we're a public company. So anybody can go buy our stock now. And as we grow larger, uh, they can take part in it. And it's a, a VERS on the, um, on the NEO exchange in Canada. Uh, so um, anybody can look up uh, Versus uh, AI and um, talk to their broker and um, buy our stock. And uh, they, are, they, are, they have as much power now to catch a young AI company as, uh, 
as a major VC firm would in the uh, in the valley. So uh, we wanted to do that as well. So this is really a people oriented uh, company, uh, people oriented business. Uh, and uh, we really see ourselves very much in line with Tim Berners-Lee and the original founders of the Internet, Binsurf, and all the other great people that uh, really brought the Internet to the table. And when we look in history, the Internet is the biggest engineering project humanity's ever undertaken. I mean, I think we're up to like 30 or 40 billion computers plugged into the global Internet when you count all the smartphones and all the cloud computing and everything else. I mean, it's remarkable. And if you had interviewed anybody in 1970, uh, they would have said, you know, before the Internet, how many computers will we have in 2020? They would have said, well, well I don't know, I don't know, maybe uh, 500,000, maybe a million. No, no we have 30 billion, you know, and uh, same thing with the World Wide Web. I mean, that trillions of dollars in business. I mean, look at these. Uh, Google's a trillion dollar company. Amazon's a couple trillion dollars. Uh, you know, Apple, uh, you know, has blown up since uh, Steve came back and created all the Internet oriented uh, business. So the, I, I, you know, the iPhone and the uh, and the iPad and everything else. And so they're a $3 trillion company. So uh, these are huge, huge, they unleash huge businesses. So you want to, you want to take, you, you want to use the power of the web. And we're, we're, we think uh, this, this model that we're doing with the spatial web and uh, now this new kind of uh, AI really brings uh, the power of, uh, of AI to everybody in the world and local communities then can bring AI to their community in a way that best suits them, not by done by some company in California or something like that. It's just yeah, a tool. I really to like the, the, the model where, you know, when you mentioned about uh, the several layer of uh, how to, you know, democratize the opportunities, right? And uh, so, you know, from the access to technology and access to investment opportunity and access to, you know, development tools, access to the brain power and, then, you know, also the existing resources or existing you know, documentation, existing digital copies of uh, the things. So all that, I think, are very important piece of when we think about what kind of future that we want, right? And that's uh, go back to the you know, responsibility side, where that's uh, in the current AI discussion. And uh, there are a lot of, uh, you know, concerns uh, regarding, you know, what, uh, you know, there are a lot of benefits around AI, but there's also, you know, many of rising concerns regarding you know the bias uh, regarding um the hallucination regarding the sustainability component of training large language models uh, and in general you know from the you know the next phase of uh, ai development uh, and there are a lot of uh, you know discussion related to responsible ai and uh, you know, for you, um, how do you see the principle of responsible AI playing a role in the development of uh, your AI? Yeah, I think we come at it a couple of ways. Uh, one is uh, one of the things we're worried about with uh, large language models and uh, uh, neural nets in general is um, alignment. Um, do, do, they, do they share our values? Are they doing something we want to have done? Second one is black box problem. Uh, how did this arrive at things? Uh, so um, uh, how do you clean the data? You know, How do you create an immune system to protect yourself? Uh, people are getting around whatever guardrails they're building uh, uh, for AI and uh, for the large language models. They're trying to put guardrails in, but every week it comes out, oh, here's how they got around that guardrail. It's almost impossible. So bad actors can use them. And so I think the way we've uh, structured this, uh, it really corrects for all of those problems, each one of those, uh, because we're not, we're not a big corporation in California building this giant AI, and then everybody in the whole world has to use our system. No, 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 no. Let the local people in Africa build their AIs, people in Europe build their AIs. I mean, you know, just... It, then you get the alignment problem. Real people are building real AIs uh, and, and maintaining them. And, uh, and so that, uh, that gets around a lot of the problem. And then the, the approach we're taking to the AI, since it's not a giant black box, but many, many small AIs, you can actually watch it, how it's making its decisions. So you can audit that. 
Uh, and uh, you've just, now you've got uh, the ability to have a, a very clean, uh, open system. You can build in immune systems. So the AIs themselves, they're all talking to each other online. If they see something uh, bad, like a, a terrorist uh, AI or something like that, they can quickly identify it. And, uh, and then we can shut it down. And it would shut down automatically. Uh, same thing with anything to do with uh, uh, anything that's illegal, you know, that in, 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 in each country. So it isn't uh, just in America. And so this is really a planetary uh, system. Um, in fact, we have our offices in um, Europe, Asia, and the U.S. Uh, for that reason, and also in, uh, in uh, Latin America. So we're already uh, uh, spreading around the world so that we, uh, we really are a planetary, planet-wide country company, not just a California corporation. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, we're having our programmer uh, uh, retreat uh, this uh, next week, and uh, it's in, uh, in England, you know, not in uh, California. And so programmers are flying in from uh, around the world. We're a remote company. Uh, we kind of came to life during COVID, uh, so uh, there was no reason to be in a big office somewhere. So our programmers are wherever they are all over the world, and um, we have PhDs and um, coders in um, uh, all, all the continents. And uh, so I think uh, it's really a planetary vision uh, with planetary responsibilities and really putting the power of AI into the hands of humanity worldwide. And uh, this is the, the right approach to democratize it. And then we can all kind of observe it as we're using it and make corrections to it. And just like cars, when we built cars, they were wonderful. But when people started having accidents, they started going through the windshields. Uh, and so somebody said, hey, let's put seatbelts in, you know. And so and we added seatbelts and then airbags and then catalytic converters and now electric uh, cars. And so uh, I think this model, this approach we're taking allows us collectively to apply our intelligence and wisdom to the running of it. And uh, <clears throat> then we also build in a lot of protections for data privacy. There's a thing called self-sovereign identity, uh, zero knowledge proofs, these kinds of things are all built into it. But these are all things everybody can go and read about. Uh, the Spatial Web Foundation is spatialwebfoundation.org. Uh, S-P-A-T-I-A-L, foundation.org. You can go there and, and um, download uh, information. Uh, you can go to our website, V-E-R-S-E-S dot A-I. And so everything's right there on the table, um, wide open. Uh, we just published a, a big uh, AI governance uh, system uh, with Dentons. Dentons is the number one global law firm, 21,000 lawyers worldwide in Asia, Europe, U.S., uh, South America and Africa. So uh, we're doing everything we can to really it kind of embed ourselves as kind of a global uh, provider of AI services, not of AI itself. We say we don't make AI, you do. We're just building the tools uh, to enable you to do AI. Yeah, I really like your approach and uh, think about, you know, Putting, putting AI development in the hand of humanity and uh, then crowdsource or crowd to, uh, of uh, intelligence from you know, individuals uh, resigned in different jurisdictions who really you know, know their own problem, know their own skills, and then also try to control their own future and uh, you know, giving them the protocol and then tools then they can just you know create uh, the type of applica application which can just make their life better and I think that that approach itself is uh, you know very very interesting and uh, for sure and uh, I'm I'm looking forward to just see what can happen out of, out of that and one thing is you know when you just look at uh, comparing you know I I I first I heard heard of your your presentation I think in 2017 so you know it's a few years and you know, since that time I have always been you know following your 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 um, um whole exciting uh, you know development of the spatial web and the global expansion and also more followers uh, you know jump into 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 the spatial web and and now that's you know as you mentioned that's uh, I triple E have the the, the 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 committee and who is overseeing the, the the spatial web and all this development are very exciting. So now that you know when you're just uh, looking at the past, looking at now, 
and also look into the future and uh, what trends do you foresee in the trend of AI and also spatial web technology and how might they impact the industries and the everyday life uh, as you described uh, just now? Yeah. Uh, great. Uh, well, one, one thing I would say, too, uh, we did, uh, as you know, from back in 2017 and 2018, uh, my partner, Gabriel Rene, and I uh, uh, wrote a, a book called uh, The Spatial Web. It's available on Amazon. And I think it gives everybody a kind of a good look at what we're bringing to the world. It takes remember a while. You also have a Chinese copy of that book, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, you're right. Uh, they, we did. Uh, we, we had it uh, published in uh, Chinese as well. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So um, that that uh, that gives a uh, entire look at uh, what we were building and what we have built. It takes a while to bring these protocols. They have to go through various drafts and this kind of thing. And so that's why we're bringing it out now. Also, um, we're just entering the age of intelligence uh, and uh, and with uh, also spatial computing. Apple just does launching their headsets. Uh, uh, I think Oculus is now bringing out the Oculus 3. Uh, they've had gone through one, two, and three already. So we're getting, uh, uh, we're going to see, I think there's probably another 100 companies making either AR or VR uh, glasses or headsets. So uh, the way we kind of see it, uh, uh, it really starts to accelerate uh, next year and in 2025. And then we're, we're really entering the age. Right now, it's still kind of an experimental zone. People are playing around with it, making artwork and doing little uh, writings and things like that. Uh, and already we're seeing great uh, updates in uh, productivity around coding and around uh, uh, writing and that kind of thing. But I think uh, we're going to see it uh, go exponential uh, over this next decade uh, where uh, uh, that's how we get from uh, no websites to 30 million websites is they don't go up in a linear form in kind of the way uh, the industrial age would grow at like 10% a year. No, they double every six months or something or, or less. And so you get that curve that goes up, you know, it goes, it just starts at, you know, two, four, eight, 16, 32 and goes straight up, you know, uh, over time. And so, uh, so I think we're entering the age of intelligence and uh, this next year will be a very exciting year, but I think it really explodes in 2025. Uh, and you can see, we have to redo, if there's 5 million apps in the couple, in the, both the app stores and there's 30 billion web pages, well, those are not AI. There's gonna be a lot of work to do, a lot of new business opportunities, Lots of new capabilities. If we're giving everybody the ability to make AI all over the world based on their knowledge and their expertise, uh, well, then these are huge new business opportunities and uh, new tools coming out to help you do your job even more effectively. So everybody's worried about job loss. I think there will be a job, there'll be ret retrainings. I mean, right now, when people are hiring, it isn't that AI is taking the job. It's that they want to know, do you know how to use AI? So... You know, but what's nice is you can actually learn it online. You don't need to go back to school. There's all kinds of courses online where for you can learn if you want to. If you want to do digital artwork, I mean, there's everything with the Dolly Three and, and Mid Journey and everything. There's all kinds of coursework on YouTube and on websites and everything to teach you all these things. So there's no excuse for not keeping up. And uh, you're probably as long as you're uh, knowledgeable on using the tools, there's going to be jobs. Right now, most companies can't find enough people that have AI knowledge. It doesn't mean that they're a PhD in AI. It means they know how to use OpenAI or they know how to use uh, Dolly or, or uh, Midjourney. And same with our tools. I think uh, they'll open up, but we've got to do all the supply chains all over the world, every warehouse, every port, every airport, all the smart cities, everything that goes on in the smart city. I mean, my gosh, there's just eons, millions and millions of dollars worth of work to be done there. So I think, uh, and then all of Africa, all of India, all of China, all of Europe, all of Russia, all of South America. No, no, no. You know, this is an exciting time. Uh, when we uh, when we mechanize the farm, uh, it used to take 80 people to run a farm. Now it takes about five uh, yeah, you know, uh, people lost their farm jobs, but then they went and got jobs making the tractors, you know. <laughs>
And uh, same thing when we mechanized the factories. It used to be a lot of factory work, and then we automated a lot of, uh, of the machinery and everything, and people just had to get trained on all the new stuff. So, uh, so I, think, uh, I think this is going to be uh, this next 25 years, and nobody can see more than 10 years anyway. But the next 10 years or so is going to be probably the most exciting time in history in terms of uh, uh, new creativity, new uh, opportunities, uh, and, and not that hard to learn because in our case, even with our AI, our AI helps you build AI. <laughs> you don't have to code. You just work with our AI and tell it and download your knowledge into it. And suddenly you've got an AI app uh, that runs on the spatial web. You don't have to be a coder. And so uh, uh, we think from 2025 on, especially, it's, we're entering a world of uh, no code. Uh, right now we're in a low code area, but we're probably going to go to a no code area. We can just, I mean, look at you know, how you make... Uh, you make artwork in uh, Mid Journey or uh, Dolly 3 or whatever, you just prompt it. What's prompting me? You just type in English. I'd like to see a panda flying through the air on the back of a giraffe, and, uh, and it'll design it for you, you know? And so we're doing the same thing with our genius uh, product. Uh, you really, uh, ultimately, you'll just uh, talk to it, and, uh, and it will help you build the uh, AI uh, application for your town, your company, or or your specialty and share it with the world. And then, uh, then the AIs will be kind of like uh, Google can index everything and help you find anything on the World Wide Web. Our, uh, our indexing systems then will help you um, find the uh, AI that uh, best uh, solves the problem for you. So we think it's an exciting time. I think it's going to be the most exciting time in history. World Wide Web was amazing when it blew up. People, people thought it was going to fail. A lot of people thought hey, this thing will never work. It's too slow. But but Jeff Bezos thought it was going to work. And, <laughs> and so uh, he started, he, he quit his job and started a little company called Amazon clear back in 1995 when uh, nobody really believed in the World Wide Web. But look at it now, you know, almost $2 trillion corporation and delivering goods and products all over the world. So the opportunities are going to be massive and, and, and probably 100 or 1,000 times larger than the World Wide Web. So infinite amount of things to be done over this next decade. Beyond that, who can see? Uh, we're going to have quantum computing coming in and other kinds of wild things. But uh, I think it's going to be an exciting time in human history. We're going to help uh, apply AI to solving the UN uh, sustainability goals. Uh, those are big problems with our climate and other kinds of issues, social issues we have all over the world. So there's a massive amount of work to be done to make this world uh, uh, a more beautiful place to live in. And uh, we're all going to do it together using our tools. We're not, you're, we're not going to wait around for some big corporation over there to save us. No, we're going to save ourselves. Uh, and so we're giving, we're giving everybody the tools in 2024 to... Uh, to contribute anything they want to contribute to the cause. Awesome. Yeah. And I think we run out of time and uh, really enjoy this conversation. And as what you said, and it's also very good at closing because the Biden update that uh, technology has to be used by human for humans. And uh, where that's, uh, you know, you also mentioned about uh, the UN SDG. And again, that's, uh, you know, many of the problems that uh, we see today and looking for new solutions, looking for solutions which can just uh, be, you know, roll out uh, with the less cost, with, uh, you know, less time and all that. I think uh, what are you building and what you're going to introduce in 2024 will definitely have that power to empower many of the, you know, more talented innovators uh, jump into the space uh, and uh, leveraging their knowledge, their, their, you know, desire to, you know, contributing to solving the, you know, bigger problem and then, you know, cross off their talent into, into, you know, the space where that's, uh, uh, this is really exciting. And, uh, you know, for anyone who want to just uh, check out uh, Dan's work and uh, you can find him on LinkedIn and uh, he already mentioned about uh, the website and, and also other information, the book as well. And uh, hopefully that's uh, we can have them back, back in the future. Tomorrow and at the same time, we'll come back to the AI 2030 and we'll have a new guest, Ken. And Ken has, is also a bestseller book author and uh, the conversation will continue. And uh, thank you again. Thanks so much, Xiaoshan. See you. Thank you, Dan. Yeah.